Thanks, everybody. Uh, please forgive my um, sore throat. I'm not sure um, the Shanghai air is uh, good for me necessarily. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be talking to you. I want to talk a little bit within the 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes that I have about some of the, let's say, religious or philosophical implications of some of the uh, technological innovations that we heard about, particularly yesterday. So we'll spend about five minutes on each of these three topics. First, sort of how we got to here, the evolution of the Dharma, particularly a movement of secularization. Uh, second, how some of the new forms of technology and also neuroscience are impacting how the Dharma is understood, particularly in secular contexts. And third and finally, a little bit of speculation uh, about where we might be headed. So first, it's worth pondering that in the West, in particular, the vast majority of people who encounter Buddhist-type meditation, or Buddhist-derived meditation, do so in a secular context, not in a religious context. So there are about one million people in the United States, where I'm from, trying meditation for the first time every year, which is a very high number. And the vast majority are in contexts like healthcare, hospitals, schools, the military, and business, and so forth. And they're also doing this work for kind of secular purposes, not for liberation, not for enlightenment, not for wisdom and compassion, even as, as we generally understand them, uh, but for things like stress reduction, achievement, uh, some kinds of happiness, and gaining an edge even on your competitors. Some might even say that some of these, gain, these aims are antithetical to tradi traditional Buddhist values, but certainly they're very different. And that's actually really striking. Like, how did this happen? How is it the case that practices that were developed uh, for monks and for nuns and for lay practitioners to gain a certain kind of liberation actually ended up being secularized uh, to the phenomena that I think we all know about uh, today? So really there's kind of a four-part process. Um, this is the subject of a, a book that I wrote called Evolving Dharma. Uh, the book is for sale out front, um, and you can just uh, see me for copies. Um, and I'll just look at each of these four stages just for a moment, just to kind of get a sense about how we got to where we are now. So the first, obviously, within the Buddhist world, there were enormous permutations and variations about what the Dharma actually is. So we've heard two expositions of the mind-only school, um, the tradition in which I teach. I teach in a Sri Lankan uh, Theravada tradition. I teach jhana meditation, which is a form of intense concentration practice. It's quite different metaphysically as well as practically speaking, from some of the other practices which we've heard about. So within the Buddhist world itself, there were enormous variations, um, and the goals of practice changed, not just the methods of practice, but also the purposes of practice. A number of Asian teachers consciously modernized uh, what they understood to be the essence of the Buddhist tradition. Sometimes this was a response to colonialism. Ironically, sometimes it's understood as, oh, well, the West modernized Buddhism, which that's not actually true. Not only were, was it Asian teachers who did the modernizing, but they often did so as an anti-colonial move um, and created a kind of essential Buddhism, especially for householders. There are a number of really good books on this. Uh, Don McMahon's Buddhist Modernism is one of them. And only later was this process sort of communicated to Westerners. So, like the reform movements in Western religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, this was essentially a reformist movement uh, to take what these teachers saw as the universal or the most important aspects of Buddhist tradition uh, and bring them to a wider audience without some of the other trimmings, particularly some of the ritual practices that many Buddhists see as the essence of their own religious identity. Third, and this is really in the 20th century, there were a number of Westerners who came in contact with these reformers, sometimes not knowing that they were reformers. So, for example, if you ask a lot of American Zen practitioners, you know, the most important figure they might say is, is you know, let's say, E.T. Suzuki or something like that, who was a scholar, and himself an innovator, not a traditionalist. But for many Westerners, he was actually seen as a kind of a traditionalist. And in the United States in particular, uh, three traditions primarily are predominant, and these modernized forms of Buddhism are kind of secularized, uh, brought together with psychoanalysis and the forms of personal growth modalities, and created a, a kind of spirituality that is less religious than it is emphasizing kind of personal transformation. And finally, the secularizers themselves. So, for example, if you were to go to a, a session on mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, in any American hospital, and it's in hundreds of hospitals now, you wouldn't hear about the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. 
right? You would be taught a secular practice of mindfulness, sort of mindfulness, not even what sati is actually in the sati Patana sutta, but a kind of aspect of mindfulness, and you would be taught it as a, as a method of stress reduction. So notice that this four-part pro um, process is one of increasing secularization from something which we might understand as religion, including visualizations of deities, for example, or offerings made to bodhisattvas, to uh, something that looks like a reformed religion, to something that looks like spirituality, to something that's actually a secular health practice. And there's not necessarily some, uh, so much self-awareness of each of those stages along the, pra the process. But we can see that this process is one of increasing secularization, and the goals change as well. So in the evolving dharma, it's not that these are just different ways to get to the same goal. Arguably, the goals themselves shift, right, from something like salvation, liberation, happiness, to health. So again, if there are one million new meditators every year in my country, in the United States, almost all of them, I would say 900,000, that's a guess, I don't have any data for that, but the vast majority are encountering this fourth type of secularized, secularized, reformed Buddhism. And so, in one sense, Buddhism is ubiquitous. It's very common in a way that it never has been before, certainly in the West. But in another sense, it's gone almost undercover. Uh, and it's shifted to become a much more of a secular phenomenon. So, not only has this process taken place, but it's backwardly influenced what many people expect or understand Buddhism to be. So, a tradition which may actually have a set of goals which we would understand as religious, is now actually understood as well. This is about happiness in a conventional uh, sense. And Jamie talked about this yesterday. Kind of distinction between liberation on the one hand, the happiness that does not depend on conditions, and the happiness just of, you know, I'm happy because they had my favorite flavor of ice cream at lunch. Um, and that, that importation of the notion of happiness back into traditional religious context is actually really interesting. I teach meditation, and what is meditation in, in Theravadan? context as a lay practitioner, and many of my students come to me expecting some of the benefits that they've heard from mindfulness in a secular context. And it's not just Buddhism, but all other forms of religion and spirituality, particularly in the West, are also expected to give some of the benefits that actually were the result of this series of secularization processes. Okay, so the second topic, neurodharma and brain hacking. Kind of fun words to throw around, maybe we'll actually build them out with a little bit more detail. So, in just the last little while, that's me, um, neuroscience has been, been able to uh, explain two key aspects of meditation experience. One, some of the behavioral changes, and second, some of the actual neurological mechanisms uh, for that change. So this is me at the, this is the lab, was at Yale University, uh, and it's Jeff Brewer, who's a well-known scientist now at the University of Massachusetts, um, and he was trying to get me to actually go into jhana, which is a very intense concentration state, all wired up to an EEG machine. I'm not sure, I'm sure that worked very well. So some of the behavioral benefits, right, are written in the in the black, right? Stress reduction, improved healing and immune response, uh, ability to focus, ability to resolve conflict, right? Even recovery from trauma, right? So anytime somebody gets too excited about the language about brain hacking. It's always helpful to remember that this really is sort of about what the Buddha said, what Buddha was teaching about, suffering and the end of suffering. Right? That these changes actually are impacting real lives. Uh, I was at a very fancy Buddhist conference in Silicon Valley a couple of years ago, and everybody was full of buzzwords and trying to sell you their latest app. But by far, for me, the best presentation came from someone who had served in the military and who had post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome disorder. And it was only meditation that was able to kind of help her. She had been medicated, she'd gone through all kinds of different therapy. And that's not true for everybody, but it is true for some people. And that for me was really profound. And we actually understand how some of these effects are actually taking place on the level of the brain. I won't go through it in detail, I'm not a scientist, or other scientists are here, but that's actually quite remarkable that we can articulate and measure the behavioral benefits and also the neurological processes that are behind those benefits. It's also true, but less understood, that even the spiritual benefits, so-called spiritual benefits of meditation, can be measured in the same way. So what might that look like? So what does freedom from suffering actually look like? What does it look like when the mind no longer attaches to the basic evolutionary processes that we want more of the pleasant and we don't want more of the unpleasant? 
What does that actually look like in the brain? So we can actually see what that's about, right? We can see that there are changes in the prefrontal cortex that enable a certain kind of resiliency that isn't present in people who don't have long-term meditation practices. So that's one of the traditional benefits, I guess, purposes of meditation. But we can actually measure some of that as well. Likewise, many people report all kinds of peak experiences during meditation. When I started out meditating about 20 years ago, that's what I thought the point was, to have like the most awesomest, great peak experience that you could ever have. And I have those, and you should have them. They're great. It's definitely not the point of meditation. It's not the point of practice. It's not, it doesn't create wisdom and compassion uh, just by having awesome experiences. But we can see now with a level of scientific detail what those awesome experiences are, what's happening in the brain. And we can even see how the brain becomes wiser and more compassionate, right, through the phenomenon of neuroplasticity and actually building, just like going to the gym. You go to the gym to build physical muscles, and you can go sit on the cushion to build a certain kind of mental muscle. It's not really a muscle. And likewise with other spiritual benefits. So this is a kind of important slide, because now benefits are practiced, but things changes in the human condition that were only understood philosophically can now also be understood to an extent scientifically. So that actually has changed the way that meditation has been taught, also in spiritual context. When I teach my students, it's very helpful to kind of communicate to them that you don't have to have a beautiful, quiet, peaceful meditation sit every time you sit down on the cushion. In fact, if that's all you're having, you're probably doing it wrong, right? That it's actually showing up, and every time the mind catches itself wandering, that moment of metacognition, every time that's building that resiliency. Every single time. It could be a thousand times a day. So the more the mind wanders, the better you are. Uh, because you're at the gym more and more and more, more and more of those contexts. So brain hacking has become a way that meditation has been taught. But now it's become very literal. Right? So I'm sure you know some of the meditation, not just the apps that are available, but the devices that we heard about yesterday that use biofeedback and other mechanisms to actually kind of measure the effects of, of mindfulness practice on the brain. I was joking, I think, over dinner yesterday, that we still don't really have a lot of compassion apps. It would be nice if we could actually you know, measure how, how nice of a person you're being and how generous you're being. You know, were you actually being more compassionate or less compassionate? A lot of the apps are just kind of helping you have those awesome peak experiences, um, which again, isn't really the point of practice. So, but we're getting there a little bit, but we're still at a very primitive level. Right? Someone yesterday mentioned the science of phrenology. That's the, the deciding, you know, what's wrong with the brain by looking at bumps on the head. And really, that's almost the level that we're at in terms of the neuroderma and understanding the science of meditation. It's very basic. It's very clunky. We hardly know what's going on. But that's also true of some of the main interventions in the healthcare industry. For example, pharmaceuticals, which are extremely blunt instruments. And we barely know how they actually work. We know that they sort of work because people report positive outcomes but we have no idea how they work. So if our understanding of meditation is clunky, our understanding of pharmaceuticals is even more clunky. What actually happens when we get good? What happens 10, 20, 30 years from now when actually the science catches up with the, with the sort of experimental data and we actually can understand and, and modify on a very more a granular level some of the changes in the brain that have been cultivated for 2,500 years. So that's the third in the third part, a little bit about the future. So consider the following hypotheticals as Dharma questions, not just technology questions. I'm not going to talk about the te technological possibility of these, but let's think about them as Dharma questions. So here's one. You can have a nano device, a tiny device, implanted in your prefrontal cortex that builds the same kinds of neural connections that increase compassion and wisdom. So when we're sitting on the cushion, when we're doing our practice of all different kinds of practice, we're building, we're changing the brain. We understand a little bit how we're changing the brain. But what if you could change the brain exactly the same way, but with a device instead of with years and years of practice? Is that real or is that fake? What's the difference? The brain is transformed in the same way, right? That's what I'm good. That's the hypothetical. In the same way that it would be through years and years of practice. But you never have to put on a robe. That's convenient. You can go and party and have all kinds of fun and then just you know, sit and have the device put into your prefrontal cortex. Is that real or is that fake? And what's the difference? Here's another. 
What if there's a wearable device that decreases activity in your PCC so that you decrease the sense of a separate self? PCC is part of the, the part of the brain that we think does a lot of the selfing. So with a powerful psychedelic experience or a powerful meditation experience, the PCC works a lot less. And because the PCC is so deactivated, your sense of separate self is deactivated. So what if we can synthesize that? Is there a difference between somebody having a powerful unit of experience of non-self and non-duality because they've worked really hard at meditation and somebody else who just actually has this device that's blinking in their PCC? Is there a difference? And if so, what is that difference? Or maybe just a smart drug that if you take this particular drug, you can have a... Or put me out of business. Jhana practice is hard. We sit for days and days and days and just focus on your breath. It's exceedingly boring. It's difficult. And then finally, you enter an absorptive state. And, you know, that's really great. Well, why not just take a drug? And a good drug. No, no bad trips. Just a smart drug that you can get, you know, at the pharmacy. Last one. What if you could actually have a small surgical intervention that actually makes you more ethical? That makes you a better person. Not just having a peak experience. But you're actually a better person because you've had this particular surgery which makes you less of a jerk. Would you sign up if you knew that you would treat your loved ones more with more love? If you knew that you would pursue justice more effectively, you'd be less selfish? Would you do it? Is it real? Is it fake? What's the difference between real and fake? I actually think it's interesting if someone has these attainments, a permanent, intuitive understanding of the self as evolution, all things being transitory, dukkha being inherent in all phenomena. Those are the three characteristics in the Theravadan Buddhist scheme. If somebody has that intuitively, not just reading it in a book, but that's actually how you live, that was actually one of the definitions of liberation. An intuitive understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So if somebody has that, does it matter where they got it from? Maybe not. Is the future of the Dharma actually post-Dharma? I would actually suggest maybe actually our sense that there's a right way to do it, maybe is itself a kind of attachment. Oh no, I'm a Buddhist. That's fake enlightenment. Real enlightenment means doing it my way, because my understanding of non-self is in fact my sense of self. And so luckily, I know that there's only real enlightenment and real liberation that comes the hard way, and all these shortcuts. That itself is attachment, right? Attachment to views. And that's ego, that's the, actual, that's the action of ego. And so, you know, if there's no separate self anyway, why do we even care how the mind has changed? There's no self, there's no ghost of the machine, there's only the machine, right? That's, that, right? that's part of the understanding of non-self. There's no separate me here that has to be authentic or inauthentic. There's no difference between, what could the animation even work? There's no difference between necessarily the, you know, the mind and this, this complex machine. So who cares if, if the transformation happens by brain attachment rather than by practice? Especially if our goal is actually a world with less suffering. If we really think hard about the capacity of Dharma practice in a broad sense to lessen suffering for all beings, wouldn't it be kind of ridiculous to insist that it has to be done the harder way? If we're actually trying to reduce suffering, to make it possible for human beings to live together in a world where we can all destroy each other so much more easily than we ever could, then it seems very selfish to say that because I went on meditation retreat for months and months and months, and I did all this hard work, now I have some idea of what authentic Buddhist practice is. Maybe the great attachment which Buddhists have to release is the attachment to Buddhism. On the other hand, I wonder if we could actually sell enlightenment in this way, if anyone would actually buy it. It might be a really unpopular product. Like, maybe I'd rather have the brain modification that just makes me have better sex and more money, rather than the brain modification which makes me want to you know, desire less. Actually, I'll have what she's having. I'll have the one where I get both, where I can feel fully, you know, fully uh, not pushed and pulled by my amygdala, but still have all of the great sandwiches that I want to eat in the world. So it's a question whether anyone would even buy the enlightenment surgery or the enlightenment tech uh, that we could put in. Maybe we would have to do it like yesterday, just on robots, because they might be interested. Or maybe we would have to lie. Maybe we'd have to do exactly what we do right now, which is that a lot of Western Buddhist teachers in particular sell meditation for one reason, but secretly we have another reason. 
Right? We sell it as you'll become a better stock trader on Wall Street. But really, we want you to stop being a stock trader on Wall Street. We sell meditation for offering various worldly benefits, but in fact, we actually believe that it's possible to transform the human condition. So maybe we would have to sell the enlightenment implantation as saying, well, but don't worry, it's going to be the best peak experience you've ever had, better than any psychedelic experience, and, and then you can, maybe we'll sell it. I actually think we are at this, this really fascinating transition where the evolution of the Dharma, which I talked about in the beginning, is actually poised to take a leap that we've never seen before, possibly beyond the notion of Buddhism itself. Do we like where that leap will take us? I think we'll find out once it does. Thank you.